The stars sure are beautiful tonight. Too bad you can't see them, Toph. Thank you to Rocket Money for sponsoring today's video. More about them later. I'm sure most of you have already seen the live action Avatar on Netflix and have already moved on from it, but I have not. Or maybe I have, but I'm just very late when it comes to my posting schedule. Still, late is better than never. So I want to use this video to talk about the live action Avatar's depiction of Katara. Don't get me wrong, I already had low expectations coming into this show. There was no way the live action was gonna improve or show anything new regarding the original story. If anything, maybe, it shows the story in a more cinematic, dark, gritty way, but not really much else. So I expected it to be mediocre. I was prepared for that. What I didn't expect was how much the character for Katara was changed. I'm not one of those people who have specific favorite characters when I consume a show. So Katara wasn't like a character that stood out to me as like, oh my God, what a great character. But now that I've seen the live action, I'm thinking back to how the cartoon Katara was. And as I think about it, I'm like, damn, she really was a great character. She had so much sass and anger and life to her. So even though I didn't consciously appreciate it at the time that I watched it, I do now because of the absence of it when I watched the live action. So I want to use this video to talk about the changes that the live action creators have made to Katara and how this can actually be a good lesson for how to write characters, especially when it comes to female characters. It's really disappointing that Netflix seems to prioritize making money and flashy stories over taking the time to invest in great writing. This is why I personally have not succumb to paying for Netflix yet. I have been tempted so many times, but I am still remaining strong. I just think it's not worth the money for me personally. And if you are in the same boat, but you keep on forgetting to cancel your subscriptions to various things that you don't even use, then this is a case where I highly recommend using Rocket Money, which is the sponsor of today's video. Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions, lower your bills, and manage your money better. It also helps you make a custom budget and grow your savings all in one place. For me personally though, I think a great feature about it is that it it helps you manage unwanted subscriptions. Basically, the app identifies any of the recurring charges that you've been getting throughout the year, and they point it out to you and they say, hey, we notice you keep on being charged X amount of dollars every month. Is this something that you actually want to do or do you want to cancel it? And if you do decide to cancel it, you can actually do it within the Rocket Money app, which is perfect because I hate dealing with customer service calls and having to wait on the line and having to explain why I want it canceled. So it's just a lot easier to go down this route. Plus, they have helped save customers up to $740 a year. So if you're interested, you can go to rocketmoney.com slash witcindy or click on the link in my description and you can get started for free. You can also unlock even more features if you go premium too. And now let's continue the rest of the video. Let's dive into looking at the way that the live action Katara was depicted in the Netflix show to go into why she doesn't work anymore as not only a female character, but as a protagonist herself. One of the most glaring things that I noticed about the live action was that Katara no longer felt like a protagonist. In the cartoon, she very much held her ground as a main character. Arguably, she was as much of a main character as the Avatar himself was. So in every episode of the cartoon, we hear Katara's voice giving the iconic monologue. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. A hundred years passed and my brother and I discovered the new Avatar. In contrast, in the live action, we have a different person entirely saying the monologue. For millennia, the four nations have lived in harmony. Since the death of the last avatar, the new incarnation has yet to emerge. This is a super small change and definitely not as egregious as a lot of big changes that they've made. So I don't think this is like a deal breaker, but I do think this is one of the small ways that can actually have really big implications for the story as a whole. The cartoon starts off with Katara and her brother interacting with each other in the Southern Water Tribe. So the moment that this story becomes established, you're following Katara from the very beginning, from the voiceover to seeing the first actual character in the show. In contrast, the live action spends the first 20 minutes of the show actually diving into the Avatar's background. This is where you see the entirety of Aang's background story of when he lives with the Air Nomads and then when the Air Nomads basically deal with a genocide and you actually see them getting killed. The discourse of whether this is necessary is a completely different topic, but I understand why they decided to do it, especially because they see Aang as the main character. He is in his own right, but this is now at the expense 
sense of not seeing Katara for a whole 20 minutes, now she's regulated into a side character in Aang's journey. You're following Aang only. Throughout the live action, she gets regulated into a character that observes what is going on, but doesn't actually do much about what's going on. In the cartoon, when you see her on a fishing expedition with her brother, the reason why they discover Aang in the ice block is because they're having an argument. Sokka says something sexist, which pisses off Katara. So she gives him a piece of her mind and goes off on a rant about how fucking sexist and annoying he is, which honestly is so valid as a sister to be ranting about. As she's ranting, the ice behind her cracks. Sokka is like trying to get her to calm down, but she doesn't calm down because the thing about cartoon Katara is that she has no fucking chill. And her anger in this specific scene is what inadvertently causes the ice behind her to crack. That is how they discover the last airbender. When we contrast this with the live action, Katara and Sokka don't actually have an argument because Sokka doesn't say any sexist line. This is because the Netflix writers decide to sanitize Sokka's sexism a little bit and tone it down because they believe that his sexism was a little bit iffy. The decision for them to sanitize his character not only takes away his character development with him having to unlearn the biases that he held, especially with the way that he grew up in the Water Tribe, but it also affects Katara's character. She doesn't have anything to be angry about now, and so then they just stumble upon the Avatar. At least in the cartoon, when they did stumble upon The Last Airbender, it was a result of Katara's anger. She was responsible for the inciting incident of the entire story. In general, stories are a lot more compelling when the main character is the catalyst of their own story, rather than having things given to them so easily. I also want to bring up the fact that in a lot of stories, we follow this structure called the hero's journey. And this is basically a concept where you're following the story of a hero transforming and growing throughout their journey, both physically and emotionally. So usually the beginning of a book shows the exposition where you are following this character in their natural world that they've been used to. That's why in the cartoon, we start off with following Sokka and Katara in their everyday lives going fishing. This is part of their ordinary world. In the live action, they decide to focus on the exposition actually being Aang's background story, which I understand because they're trying to push Aang as the main character and maybe they want to have a flashy beginning. But something always happens in the hero's journey, which is the call to adventure. This is some kind of conflict that happens and disrupts their everyday life and now they are called to leave their familiar world in search of something. The hero initially refuses the call. It could be that they don't feel ready yet or maybe they feel very comfortable with where they are, but eventually they always leave because they are meant to be the hero in their story. So in the Avatar of the Last Airbender story, the call to adventure is basically the characters moving away from the Southern tribe and going all the way to the North Pole. He offers to take Katara to the other side of the world so that she can find a waterbending master. Their motivation to go to the Northern Pole is still because of her. And like the classic hero that initially refuses the call, she says, I don't know. I I've never left home before. This is such a traditional hero's journey that we see in a lot of other stories. But then in the live action, that gets diluted in such a cheap way. The group decides to go to the North Pole because Aang has this vision of what happens. And so now this decision to leave and go on this grand adventure is rooted in his vision rather than seeing the characters make that decision for themselves. It's not just Aang going on his own journey to save the world. It's also Katara learning to strengthen her own abilities and learn from a water bending master. And this goal happens to coincide with Aang wanting to master water bending so that he can become the avatar. These two characters deciding to go on a journey together to benefit both of them shows that they are co-protagonists, whereas the live action shows one character getting a vision like he's Raven from That's So Raven getting a premonition. So again, the live action writers are really focusing on Aang only and as a result, kind of paying dust to Katara. By being so focused, focus on only developing your male main character, but not your female one, it really weakens your story as a whole. She's not truly the main character if she doesn't do anything that helps with the inciting incident or has her own call to her own hero's journey. And 
why this decision is especially so egregious is because Katara was the glue that held everyone together in the gang that you follow throughout the show. So if her character is underdeveloped, the entire gang is going to suffer because of it. She's literally the reason how the gang even formed in the first place. And by taking that away from her, it makes her such a passive character. And as I was watching the entire live action, I noticed that most of the time she really just stands there without really doing anything. Like every now and then she'll do some water bending to help for like an action scene. But in terms of any important dialogue or development of a scene, she doesn't really do much. The live action definitely invested a lot of money into the CGI for the action scenes. So you do see Katara water bend every now and then. But just having a character perform a few action scenes isn't enough to really make a good character. I would argue that watching the live action made it feel more like Sokka was the main character alongside Aang rather than Katara who was most of the time in the background maybe every now and then she'll go on some monologue about having hope but as you're watching the show you see back to back important developments for Sokka's character like learning how to fight alongside the Kyoshi warriors in one episode and then in the next episode he learns about engineering so the fact that he gets to learn all these new skills or even learn more things about himself in these back to back episodes shows that there's so much going on with Sokka's character and again very little with Katara's character. We find out about how Sokka grew up so early because he's the only man in the tribe and so as a result he feels like he has to be the caretaker, the protector. They talk about this constantly in the dialogue throughout the live action. But ironically in the cartoon Katara was the one who had the arc of being forced to be a parent and while Sokka does deal with a lot of things as a character it kind of feels like the live action took Katara's story arc and gave it to Sokka instead. This elevates Sokka's character but at least Katara as an empty shell of who she used to be. So now you've lost both the external story of her having more agency, breaking the iceberg due to her anger, going on the hero's journey herself, as well as the internal journey that her character goes through of having to grow up too early, being the protector, being the provider. So what does she do in the live action? She water bends every now and then and she gives some dialogue about having hope. And then that's pretty much it. Another key component that I felt was missing from her character were her flaws and her anger. When you're writing a character, I think regardless of whether you decide to make them angry and sassy like the original cartoon was or make them more meek and shy like the live action was, what's important regardless of the character's personality is that they need to have flaws. And what was so great about Katara's character in the cartoon was that she had so many flaws. Not only did it make her more human, it was also necessary for her to grow and develop as a character. Katara was someone who was super ambitious to a fault and she at times was even selfish. We see her get jealous about Aang learning all of these abilities to waterbend and as a result of her jealousy she goes ahead and sneaks off to steal the pirate scroll so that she can learn waterbending herself. But then we contrast this to the live action where she doesn't steal the pirate scroll. Instead she magically discovers the scroll in her bag as a gift from her grandmother. So not only is this no longer an action that shows her flaws but it also strips away of her agency. It's another example of how she doesn't do anything to further develop the story but instead is given the thing in the first place so she becomes even more passive and I really have to emphasize her anger because that was something that I missed so much in the live action. It was super important for her character because it was part of her grief over losing her mother. In the live action you do see her character grieve over being an orphan but the cartoon shows that anger is such an important part of that grieving process. Her anger is why we get the inciting incident of her breaking the ice and it's also why we see her journey to become a waterbending master and because she decides to go on a journey that also drives Aang's journey. Instead in a live action it's the other way around where Aang is just pulling Katara on his own journey and Katara is just a passive observer that happens to go alongside with him. When we do see her talk she talks about the power of hope and friendship which is perfectly fine. Those were the same beliefs that she had in the cartoon as well but that can't be all there is to her and I found that the Netflix live action stripped her down to just that one personality trait as they did to other female characters throughout the show. Sugi was another example of a great character that I kind of felt like was regulated into a love interest for Sokka. I felt similarly for Yue who leaned more towards being a manic pixie dream girl who was also a love interest for Sokka. Maybe there was more to her but to be honest I was kind of more so distracted by the wig and in the case of Katara I do feel like she was just simplified into being a good girl. There's no problem with having a female character 
who is well behaved and idealistic. But the problem is if that's the only character traits that they have and they don't have any flaws, then that's not a real person. This is just some caricature of a meek girl who occasionally spouts some dialogue about hope and friendship. And I feel like what made her so compelling as a character is that she was motherly, she was gentle, but then she was angry and she did have a sassy attitude. And sometimes she was a straight up bitch. Remember that one time when she was talking to Toph? The stars sure are beautiful tonight. Too bad you can't see them, Toph. That's the kind of nasty shit that would get her canceled on Twitter. And I respect a real bitch like that. A lot of her rage also came from wanting to master waterbending so badly. But in the live action, one of the changes is that she doesn't work to earn what she wants to do so badly. It's often given to her very easily. Unlike the original cartoon, Katara no longer learns about waterbending from a master like Paku. Instead, she picks up waterbending quickly and you see another student call her a master. But there was no kind of struggle or grit that she had to go through in order to get to that point. The fact that the end of the first episode showed Katara, who's supposed to be a total amateur, suddenly able to raise a bunch of ocean water like hundreds of feet into the air so that it can block like a giant fireball was such a huge leap for her character to go from zero to 100 that again, it really just goes to show that I felt like the writers didn't give a shit about Katara because they didn't bother to develop her character properly properly, whether it was her waterbending abilities or her personality or her flaws or anything like that. In conclusion, I feel like if you are approaching a main character in your story, there are so many things that you have to write to make sure that they are a formidable protagonist to follow. So much of that includes agency, making sure that things don't just happen to them, but that they are responsible for the things that are happening in the story in the first place and that their actions are developing the narrative and pushing it further. Otherwise, they just get regulated into an observer role and that's not nearly as fascinating to watch. I think also developing flaws is super important to really make the character more human. And not only that, how do their flaws move the story forward? How do they learn from their mistakes? And I think when you're writing a female character, it's so important to just not water down, pardon the pun, <laughs> water down their character into just one trait. I would feel this way even if Katara's only trait was just her being angry all the time. There's so much more to her than just one personality trait. She was angry, she was gentle, she was forgiving, she was bitchy. Characters really shine when they can have contrasting personality traits because people are complex. I did see that Avatar has been renewed for season two and three, which honestly, I don't think is necessary at all. But the cast seems cute from what I've seen in the interview, so I'm glad that they're happy about it. I'm glad that people get to keep their jobs. I just wish that the writing had higher standards. And while it is possible that future seasons will probably take into account the criticisms about season one. I just think that if you screwed it up from the beginning, it's gonna be really hard to make up for that in future seasons. And again, why should we? When we have the original cartoon in the first place as an example for great writing. If you have watched the live action, I'm curious to hear what you thought about the show and what it did well and what it didn't do well. And I'm also curious if you have any other examples of great character writing, because I think a story can have a really great plot, tons of great action scenes, but if their characters aren't fully realized, then the story doesn't stand as strongly in comparison. So we can talk about it in the comments, but until then, I'll see you next time. Bye!